hey, the Rangers finally signed a starting pitcher, or did they? On today's show, I'm breaking down what Michael Lorenzen brings the Rangers and talking about what is the best case scenario for the Texas Rangers in 2024. All that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked onto the World Series Texas champion, Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan, covering this team for 10 seasons, including all five as the founder and host of this podcast. Thank y'all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. Hit subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform and on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the show is to comment nearly any single thing below. Now, I took yesterday off, recorded yesterday's show on Wednesday, late afternoon, after the Rangers game. I thought all, all of the news will have broken, and I took yesterday off because it was my birthday, and I'm like, I'm not working on my birthday. General policy, especially my 30th, and I said, unless the Rangers sign Jordan Montgomery, and I'm glad I qualified it with Jordan Montgomery and not sign a starting pitcher because the Rangers did that at about... 11.43 p.m. on Wednesday night, about 15 minutes before I, I unveiled my uh, my my show for that day and, you know, just kind of rendered all of that almost null and void at that point. But the Rangers signed Michael Lorenzen to a one-year $4.5 million deal with incentives. Could be up to, I believe, $7 million. And his role is TBD at this point. He was an all-star last year. He threw a no-hitter. He spent time between the bullpen and the starting rotation with the Detroit Tigers and the Phillies. He threw that no-hitter while wearing Vans, a very cool accomplishment if you're a big skater person, then Michael Lorenzen might just be your guy. And bottom line, he's fine. He's pretty good. For $4.5 million, that is a good deal to get a guy like Michael Lorenzen. He doesn't beat himself with a lot of walks. His stuff isn't anything crazy. Fastball's pretty good. Slider's pretty good. Um, should be fine. Decent addition to this rotation or to this bullpen as a long relief guy. And The versatility is the important part of Michael Lorenzen. That is by far the most important part of him signing with the Rangers is that he gives the Rangers some options about what they want to do. Evan Grant described him as think him think of him as pitcher Ezekiel Duran. Because Zeke Duran's gonna play a bunch of different positions and he he could be pretty decent if he's stuck at just one, but the versatility is what gives him value and I think that's also uh the case for Michael Lorenzen. He started the first twenty games last year and to that point, which the 20th game was that no-hitter with Philadelphia, he had a 328 ERA, and he struck out nearly three times as many batters as he walked. Uh, and you know what? He was really darn good. But the workload kind of wore him down. Actually, really wore him down. He had not pitched a significant workload to that degree in the big leagues. He pitched in 18 games and just 97 and two thirds innings with the angels back in 2022. That's where he signed as a starting pitcher. Um, and then in Detroit, he started 18 games there at a three and a half ERA was an all-star started a few games for the Phillies and then moved into the bullpen where he just wasn't as effective down the stretch. The guy was really worn down. That kind of a heavy, a heavy workload is is not what he was used to and, and not what he was ready for, which is why he didn't factor in much into that Phillies bullpen down the stretch and really not at all in the playoffs. But this is about the role that the Rangers need from him this year. If he could repeat what he did last year in the first half, 18 starts, 105 and two-thirds innings with Detroit, and then not worry about what he did with Philadelphia, that's fine. That's the Rangers need. At this point, I think he's probably their number six starter. I think he slots into a long relief role in the bullpen. I think Cody Bradford still stays in that rotation, but it gives you another long relief option in the pen, and I think Jose Urania is still going to make this opening day roster as another long relief option because I, I think the Rangers might need multiple 
at the start of the season and might even need multiple down the stretch with depending on who's healthy, how healthy they are and how deep they're going into games because of the guys in this rotation, Ivaldi, Gray, Dunning, all of those guys, they, they can give you usually, you know, six ish innings per start, which is ideal. What you're looking for from a starting pitcher. But with the two lefties in this rotation, Bradford and Heaney, you don't really want them going as deep into games. They are not quite as good at going deep into games consistently, especially Bradford. I really don't want to see him face the order a third time all that often as a starter. I think he's capable as a number five starter. Not amazing a number five starter, but you need a decent number five starter, and I think Bradford is that. And having multiple guys in your pen of that can go and give you multiple innings if, say, Heaney only goes four and a third, or, say, Bradford goes three and two-thirds in an outing. Having two guys like Lorenzen and like Arania who can go in there and, and give you those multiple innings and, and not wear down the rest of your you know top-end options, that's ha- that has value. That has a lot of value. And at such a cheap, cost-controlled you know, price point of four and a half million dollars for one year. It, it gives the Rangers some flexibility to where if, I, and I don't think that this means that they're not signing Jordan Montgomery at all. I, I don't think this really had an effect on that. If Monty's going to come back, he's going to come back. If not, then he's not. Maybe the Rangers will use some of the uh, probably bazillion dollars they got from the merch sales of that gold championship merch on day one. To go and say, hey, all right, hey Jordan, we we got some extra cash if you want, you know, an upped one year offer. There was also a theory I saw espoused on Twitter by Adam Morris that maybe Montgomery would sign a deal after the season had started, so that he wouldn't get a qualifying offer at the end of next year, heading into this this next off season of the winter of twenty twenty four. Because that's something that he doesn't want attached to him because it makes it much harder for teams to sign him. Much fewer teams are incentivized to sign him because they will lose draft pick compensation and other things like that. But I like this deal of Lorenzen. Gives the Rangers some extra bulk because think about how many guys started games for the Rangers last year. There were nine different starting pitchers who started at least six games for the Rangers last year. Nine! That is a lot of starting pitchers. Now, I don't think it'll be nine this year of guys that start six or more games, but it might end up being the case. Right now, your opening day rotation, Evo, Gray, Heaney, Dunning, Bradford, next three, Lorenzen, Urania, maybe Adrian Sampson, and then you go down one more. That's the ninth starting pitcher. The the ninth guy at this point would be Owen White or Jack Leiter, or maybe Colvin. No. It would not be Colvin. But still, I don't think the Rangers will have to go you know, nine pitchers deep in the first half. That would be nuts. It might end up being nine because they've got three guys on the shelf who hopefully will get at least six starts in them, all of them, in Scherzer, in Malley, and DeGrom. I'm hoping all those guys get at least six starts, especially DeGrom. If, if DeGrom gets six or eight starts, then oh, I'm feeling, I'm feeling really good about this season. But still. This is a nice depth signing. Give the Rangers give themselves some more insurance options, and that is incredibly important. Having depth when you've got a starting rotation that is filled with honestly anybody with pitchers because pitchers get hurt. It's what happens, especially when they're older, especially when there's wear and tear. Lorenzen gives the Rangers some padding. It is a nice, smart deal. I can't believe that nobody else did this because. There are so many other teams that could have used Lorenzen on a deal like this, especially teams that are in contention that could just use that much more insurance. But hey, no one else did. The Rangers signed him, and I feel really good about this signing and about this team for 2024 because I'm feeling like the best-case scenario, well, we all know what the best-case scenario is for the Rangers in 2024. Or do we? Coming up, we're going to talk about what would make this best-case scenario, what factors would lead into it, how good this team can be, and what it would take to establish a Texas Rangers dynasty. Right after this, we're from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Ibotta. The new year for many people means resolutions to start saving money, so stop shopping without getting anything in return. 
Start getting cash back on every purchase you make with Ibotta. Ibotta is a free app that gives you the most cash back every time you shop at hundreds of items from groceries to beauty supplies to toys, so you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. The average Ibotta user earns $145 per year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip, buy that flight you've been eyeing, that game you've been dying to go to, or that fancy dinner you've been craving, or maybe you get yourself some new Rangers gear, some championship gear, because you can never have enough. Join the over 50 million savers to, and earn cash back every time you shop with over 2,700 2, brands of, and retailers, including Lowe's, Macy's, Sephora, Best Buy, and more. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying the Ibotta app by using code LOCKEDONMLB when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store, download the free Ibotta app, and start earning cash back and use code LOCKEDONMLB. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store and use code LOCKEDONMLB. This episode is also brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. My bracket is already so, so, so significantly busted. But with FanDuel, whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seat, it is time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. You know who's not going to win it all? Texas Tech, who I picked to win it all in my bracket and, and lost... In the first game to NC State, not, not not my best, but hey, FanDuel, with FanDuel, I, I can still win. I can still win, despite my bracket being in tatters. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Shout out to the everyday for making Lockdown Rangers your first listen every single day. You're back on Monday, starting my season preview series. All kinds of big questions, things to look at for the Rangers, and predictions as well. <clears throat> now, what is the best case scenario for the Texas Rangers in 2024? Coming off of a World Series win, going back to back, I mean, obviously the, the best you can do in a season is, is winning a championship. The Rangers did that last year. So... What is the best case scenario, the, the highest of high expectations for this Rangers squad in 2024? Yeah, this team is good enough to win a World Series. They just did it, and they could do it again. But <clears throat> once you come off the high of, of one World Series, you kind of start to think, you know, longer term, bigger bigger picture. You know, the flags fly forever, but what if it's not just flag flies forever? It's flags, uh, multiple championships, dynasties, historic things that haven't been done in ages. And going back to back would be historic. It would be something that no one has done since the 1998 to 2000 Yankees. No one's done it this millennia of going back to back. The Rangers want to do it. And they want to do it again and again and again and again. And they absolutely can. And here are some of the things that would lead to that best case scenario, to a best case season, to an AL West title, a absolutely unquestioned dynasty, the start of a long, prolonged run. <clears throat> now, on the pitching side, I think one of the things that is going to really determine how good this team can be in 2024, whether it's a team that's you know sc scrapping to to stay alive and waiting for those pitching reinforcements in Scherzer, Malley, DeGrom, or if it's a team that is just coasting and those guys get back whenever they get back, and, and the Rangers, you know, could use them, but don't necessarily need them because they are flogging everybody. And on the pitching side, I think that starts with John Gray popping off. I think he is a big X factor for the Rangers this season. He starts the year in the rotation as the number two starter behind just Nathan Eovaldi. We know what Nathan Eovaldi can do on the big stage when the Rangers need him. I am very confident that if healthy, Nathan Eovaldi is going to be an ace caliber pitcher and an all-star caliber pitcher like he was last year in the first half. And I'm hoping that he holds up and is dominant and you know can get the Rangers to bridge that gap when the reinforcements come. But behind him, there's, there's still a lot of question marks in this rotation of how good can these guys be really. I feel really good about Dane Dunning's last season not just being a fluke. I think he'll be solid but not spectacular. I don't know if he's going to repeat what he did in the first half last year, stepping up for DeGrom when he had you know, a sub-3 ERA for, what, like 10 starts? It was nuts. 
I don't think he is going to do that or needs to, but Dunning is solid. He, I'm not super trusting to be, you know, the dominant version of himself that he was with the Dodgers in 2022 with the Rangers. Thought they were getting when they signed him. I, I think those hopes are kind of gone. But with John Gray, we've seen a lot of stretches where John Gray is is fantastic. I mean, in the month of May last year, he had a sub-2 ERA in five starts, just over 32 innings, and he was dominant. He had an ERA below four every month in the first half of last season, and then the second half happened, and it, it was it was not as good for Mr. John Gray. An ERA north of four in every month after the All-Star break, July, August, September, but he came up big when the Rangers needed him most in October. Those innings that he provided in the World Series were crucial in two of the biggest games in franchise history. In Game 1, people forget about how he pitched an inning in, what, two-thirds? Not quite two innings at that point, but still magnificent work from him to keep that game close, to keep the Rangers still in it. Not the best game from Nate Eovaldi, Game 1 of that World Series, but we all know how that ended, and the Rangers don't get that shot of just being down two of just being a Leoli Tavares walk and a high drive, it's tied Corey Seager home run away from tying it, and then an El Bombi walk off in the 11th without John Gray. And then in Game 3, I feel like before I went back and rewatched that game, I forgot how close that was the entire game. When Max Scherzer went out in the third, it was it was dire. It was, it was still, still a nothing-nothing game at that point. Still a very close game. Actually, the Rangers might have had one run, but it was it was very close for the entirety of that game. And John Gray comes in in the fourth inning, gives the Rangers three magnificent innings. The best version of John Gray is a darn good pitcher. And if he can be that for the first half or for most of this year, just find a little bit more consistency, that really elevates the ceiling of this team. Other things that need to go right on the pitching staff, well, just a quick and effective return from Max Scherzer. I feel like people were just writing off Max Scherzer as, oh, this guy's washed. This guy can never be good again. This guy hasn't been good in forever, so uh, it's just it's it's so over for Max Scherzer. No, no old pitcher can ever be good again. Well, I kind of thought that about Justin Verlander when he had Tommy John surgery and missed you know a significant chunk of time, and he came back with the Astros, and and oh, all he did was win a freaking Cy Young that first full year back. Guys can do that. Guys of this ilk, of this caliber, guys with multiple Cy Youngs. I mean, he's got three Cy Youngs under his belt, Max Scherzer. And people think this guy is just washed? Apparently he's ahead of schedule, according to John Heyman, for his return. I still am hoping for a a June return. Don't want to get too aggressive and, and ask for like 180 innings of Max Scherzer coming back too soon from injury and then not being ready for the playoffs or not being able to stay healthy for the full season. Get Max Scherzer back. Get Get Scherzer back. Just... Just do that. Get the healthy version, the good version of Max Scherzer back. And I, I think there is another gear from from even what he showed last year with the Rangers. I mean, his expected ERA last year was significantly better than his actual ERA. His actual ERA was 377. Expected ERA, 328. That was in the top 14% of baseball. Expected batting average was in the top 10% or top 11% of baseball. Still striking guys out. Still not walking a lot of guys. Still not losing a lot of velocity and... And stuff wise, his stuff is still good. This is still an incredibly good pitcher that I feel like a lot of people are are sleeping on. And Max Scherzer really takes this team. If he comes back in June, is healthy, is effective, slots in as the Rangers number two or maybe even number one starter at that point. I mean, we'll see how good he looks, but there's no reason to think this guy can't be a really darn good pitcher and help the Rangers a lot for you know the majority of the season. He comes back early June. He's still pitching in over half the season. This is an all-time great that I think people are really underrating, really undervaluing, because he had a crappy two months with the Mets on a terrible Mets team. I feel like that's insane. Also, he got lit up on the big stage because he came back way sooner than anyone expected from that injury. And people thought, oh, well, that, that must mean this guy's washed. No, it means he's an extreme competitor. And the fact that he was able to give the Rangers some quality innings in that game three of the World Series against the Diamondbacks, the games against the Astros, they, 
they weren't quite as quality, but they were still innings in the ALCS, where he clearly wasn't fully right. Same could be said about the World Series, where he gave the Rangers you know, three quality innings there. This guy's incredible. Also, this bullpen, I think, is still vastly underrated. I, I feel good about Jose LeClerc being the Rangers' closer and being good. I don't have a lot of questions about David Robertson. I think he's going to be solid, serviceable, to pretty darn good. But what takes that bullpen from eh, pretty good average middle-of-the-road bullpen to elite bullpen is one of Josh Spores or Kirby Yates being significantly better than expected. I think both of those guys could be exceptional this year. I think expecting both of them to be exceptional or just very, very good might be a bit much. And relievers are finicky. So say one of those guys breaks out and is an all-star caliber pitcher. Like, I know they both can be. They both have the stuff and the abilities to do so. And if one of those guys goes nuclear and gives the Rangers a, a top three options that are all very, very trustworthy, and then I don't think the other one's going to fall off a cliff necessarily, but I think you know the other one's going to be at worst a, a mediocre fourth best option as a, relie- as a high, high leverage reliever, that is a darn good bullpen. And I haven't even gotten to the best part of this team. We're talking about what can take this team to the stratosphere, what they need to do to establish dynasty. Right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports. From live games to highlights to in-depth analysis, Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick you can plug directly into existing TVs, provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball, the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more. Keep up to date on the latest in the world of sports. March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't already, you have got to check this out. Trust me. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash LockedOnFireTV. Now, I talked about what would make the pitching side of this team the best case scenario. But for the hitting side, what what would lead to a world-beating best case scenario? Well, it starts with Evan Carter and Wyatt Langford coming up being the twin princes that are promised, fighting each other for Rookie of the Year votes, splitting the vote, going 1-2, and having not just a good rookie season, but a star-caliber level season. Like an absolutely world-beating seasons. I think both those guys are perfectly capable of doing so. I think the offensive upside for White Langford is, is obviously just through the freaking roof. This guy can be an all-star this year on the strength of his bat alone. Evan Carter is an incredibly complete player that's already star caliber, already won a World Series, been a postseason hero. And I think White Langford saw that and said, well, that looks pretty cool. I want to do that too. And I think he will. The rest of this offense, I mean, the, the reason that this team won the World Series and was so darn good all year long I said it about a billion times last year, and I'll probably say it a billion more this year. It's the depth of this lineup. Now, the Rangers don't have the Braves offense from last year. They don't have the Dodgers offense from this year. But what they do have is one through nine of the guys who I think are going to be everyday players this year. I could see scenarios for all of them having at least an 800 OPS this year. Every single one of them. Jonah Heim. Louis Tavares, Zeke Duran, Nathaniel Lowe, everybody in this lineup I think is perfectly capable of having an OPS of 800 or better. Now, are they all going to do that? No, that's not realistic. That's not going to happen. Maybe it will, but probably not. Very almost certainly not. But that's the thing that made this team so good is, is having you know a top three of you know Shohei Otani, Mookie Betts, and Freddie Freeman, the Rangers don't have that. They don't have three guys that are all, you know, in the conversation for one of the top ten hitters in the world. I think they might have two, 
at the end of the season, depending on how good Wyatt Langford is. Um, but they've, they've already got one in Corey Seager, who's magnificent. But having you know a number five, six, seven hitter, all guys that are all-star caliber, all guys that are you know 15 to 20% above league average, that's what takes it offense and, and kicks it up into the next gear. Having a number nine hitter of Leo Tavares, who was a borderline all-star last year, that's what takes this offense and makes it insanely good. And there are plenty of guys last year that you could argue are, had a down year and, and could be even better this year. Jonah Heim was sensational in the first half and really fell off in the second half. I think the Rangers are doing a lot to keep him healthier throughout the season. Nathaniel Lowe is coming off of a really down season, and I think his offensive upside is is through the roof. And Josh Young is coming off his rookie year where he was really good for a rookie, but could be significantly better, I think, in year two. And then you add a full year of Evan Carter and White Langford. I mean, this offense could just be the best in baseball. That's how good this offense could be, even counting how good the Braves offense is. That's how good... I think this offense can be. Now, what's going to hold this team back is is starting pitching, and hopefully it stays healthy in the first half, and, and hopefully the reinforcements come back, and hopefully they're all fully healthy when they do. And if they do and they are, then this team's going to be absolutely sensational. They don't really need Jordan Montgomery. They don't need it. A best case scenario is, is Jordan Montgomery, after I finish recording this, signs a one-year deal with the Rangers, and the Rangers show up, they're, they're really only concerned about this team. Maybe you can add a few more bullpen options, because you can always add a few more high-leverage bullpen options, but like, there's not a whole lot of concern about like big, glaring holes with this team, like there was last year with the bullpen and questions about how good the offense would be, and the Rangers answered that pretty qu- pretty quickly, that this offense was going to be really darn good. But this team is on the verge of a dynasty. A dynasty. Multiple championships is a dynasty. And unfortunately, their biggest rival right now has a bit of a dynasty. Going to seven straight ALCSs, that, that's as close to one. Allegedly two championships. That's, that's a dynasty. And the Rangers have a chance to kill that off. They have a chance to win the AL West to snap that embarrassing losing on the last day of the regular losing the division on the last day of the regular season last year which you know ended up working out and it's fun to make fun of the Astros for losing all four home games of the ALCS but the Rangers would rather have just had home field advantage and taken care of business and you know go on and win a second championship quash all those questions about oh, I don't know if the Rangers are really that good to win that championship go off and, and face the the Dodgers, this super team that's assembled and crushed them in the World Series. Maybe crush the Astros along the way in the playoffs again. Maybe do it in the ALDS before and snap that streak of ALCS appearances. Then go on to the ALCS, crush the Orioles, who every, everyone is ra- waiting to crown the next big thing in the American League, and then crush the Dodgers. So there will be no Mariners fans calling it a Mickey Mouse championship. I, I don't know. It's it's just there's a lot of things that can go well for this team this year, and the ceiling is obviously through the roof, and this is the start of a potential dynasty. These guys are here for a long time. This team, this core that's assembled, this lineup is going to be here for a long, long time, pretty much at least three seasons from from every hitter who's going to be a big part of this lineup every day, assuming that Nathaniel Lowe's injury doesn't get worse and somehow Jared Walsh becomes a everyday starter for a big chunk of the season, the rest of this lineup is going to be here for a long time. Heim, Lowe, Simeon, Seager, Young, Tavares, Garcia, the other two young guys in in Carter and Langford. This is going to be the same team for a long time. And this is a, a franchise that wants to establish itself as a dynasty and has an incredibly high ceiling. I think of reaching that ceiling last year, doing it without Jacob DeGrom winning the championship without him, that was possible. And it's, it's still possible this year, but I think getting DeGrom healthy for the playoffs, getting him, if, if the Rangers get Jacob DeGrom healthy on August 1st, and he's fully built up and is fully actualized self throwing a hundred pitches a game and, and being the nastiest guy on the planet at the end of August, down the stretch in September and in the postseason. Rangers have a healthy Scherzer and DeGrom and Ivaldi come playoff time as your one, two, three. It doesn't even matter who else is in this rotation because that's going to be 
an unstoppable juggernaut of a team if those guys are the versions of themselves that we, we all expect them to be come playoff time. Then you add this insanely talented lineup, a pretty decent bullpen, and plenty of depth along the way on the bench and in the bullpen and waiting in the wings if the Rangers have injuries to their starting pitching. I mean, I haven't even talked about Tyler Malley basically at all, and he is he could be very helpful for the Rangers this year. Or he could provide not a whole lot this year and, and mainly just be for next year, which I think might be the scenario with Malley. Who, who knows at this point? But I know that this is the start of something special for the Rangers. They are not satisfied with just one championship, like many of us are, and they have a chance to beat a super team, face a super team in the World Series this year in in the Dodgers, they, or it, if it's the Braves, or if it's the Phillies, or whoever the heck it is, it doesn't freaking matter. The Rangers win multiple championships. They're the first team to ever go back to back since the 1998 to 2000 New York Yankees. That is going to put them on the map as the team. The team in Major League Baseball. Not the flashy Dodgers. Not the Braves, who have won a bunch. Not the Astros, who have went to the ALCS a billion times. Not the Orioles, who are the next big wave. It will be the Rangers that are the talk of Major League Baseball. And there will be no looking away from this team. We won't have another offseason where everyone's like, okay, the Rangers won the championship. Who cares? They're, they're not the Dodgers or the Braves or whatever. No. This will be actually the team to beat, which they should be anyway because they are the reigning champs. But because not as many people watch the championship, for whatever reason, the Rangers are, are doubted coming off of that World Series championship. There will be no doubts. And this could be the start of something incredibly special. Bruce Bochy knows what it's like to be a reigning World Series champ and to establish a dynasty. And he, he started that. Year one, already won a championship. Year two, definitely going to compete for a championship. Hopefully win about a bazillion games, win the AL West, and crush all doubters. Year three, go for a three-peat. Year four, who knows? Who knows what can happen with this team over the next few seasons? But, but this year... Coming off of that first championship, what do you do? How do you back it up? I think this team has done a good job, maybe not as good of a job of of fortifying themselves and not bringing back Montgomery for that first half. But I mean, even at this point, if you if you sign Montgomery, if, if you have a fully healthy rotation come postseason, if Jordan Montgomery your, would be your number four starter at that point, and I don't think the Rangers are going to spend number two type of money that that Jordan Montgomery is asking for on that. Or maybe he does settle for a one-year deal, and then I get really, really obnoxious about the Rangers winning 100, 110, 157 games the regular season. But I think 95 wins is very much on the table. This is a true talent 96-win team last year with their Pythagorean record, and, and I don't think this team is worse at all than last year. In fact, I think it's a decent chunk better. Now, I think the rest of the American League got better this offseason. I think the Mariners got better. I think the Astros got a little bit better. I think the Orioles will continue to get better. And um, some other teams around the AL East also maybe got a little bit better. Maybe the Yankees did. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they'll com be competitive. Maybe they won't. But this team is incredibly talented. This is the start of something special. And backing it up in the first year of being a defending champion is important. And I think this is when they establish themselves as a dynasty. I think this is the year they go back to back. I think this is the start of a reign of terror from your Texas Rangers. Terrorizing Major League Baseball. Oh, the Dodgers tried to assemble a super team to kill off this Rangers dynasty. That's what we're going to be saying in, in 5, 10 years. And, and it didn't work. Oh, the Astros had all this long run of, of being, you know, they were so terrible for half a decade. And, you know, they had a long run and the Rangers killed off that dynasty. Oh, the Mariners, they had so much pitching and, and so much a talented lineup, and the Orioles were the next big thing, and we'll look back at it and say, oh, well, it's, it's a shame they had to do that during the Rangers dynasty because this team is not satisfied with one championship. They want more, and by golly, I think they're going to get it. That's going to do it for this week's editions of Locked on Rangers. Thank you all so much for listening. We'll be back next week to preview the season because next week is opening day. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy World Series champion Texas Rangers baseball.